Okay, so I think we're good to go. So again, if anybody can't see us or hear us or see the nice, beautiful PowerPoint we're about to show you, um, now would be an awesome time to let us know. <laughs> okay, so show and tech. <laughs> Okay, so the, the folks that are going to be your crew for show and tech this year, um, your affiliate challenge masters are David Jolly Jared, who's not so jolly tonight. He's not feeling well, so he wasn't able to be here. I'm Susie Patch Polanya. And I'm Kayla Ivory Bone Steffens. And I'm Justin Peg Wilson. We're excited to be working with you this year on this challenge. We think that you're going to really enjoy this challenge. Go ahead. Yeah. Jump right in there, too. Okay. So, um, we're going to take you through a journey of discovery. So, how this PowerPoint is going to go. We're going to talk about scoring and how scoring works with the challenge. And then, we're going to move on to the technical effect, um, clarifications, rules of the road, technical design, resources. And then, we'll hit our, um, our goal, our buried treasure of creativity, workmanship, and integration. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it not? Hold on. Sorry, I think the PowerPoint's not updating. Give me one second to make sure that it is. Okay, is it updating now? Sorry, some technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> You can't see it. Okay, is it changing? There it goes. It's working now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk about the challenge anatomy. So we're going to start off with um, the challenge is really broken up into two different pieces. Well, three different pieces. You've got the stage movement piece, and then you've got the team choice elements. So within that stage movement, you've got the opening act with the technical effect number one, and then the headlining act with your technical effect number two. So, you want to talk about yeah. so the opening act is and we want to make the point that your team gets there's so many nice places in this challenge this year where the kids get to make the decisions about what they want to have the opening act and the main act can be equally important the kids need to tell us when the opening act is finished and when their main act is beginning we want it to be two separate pieces related to each other. One of the things that we're going to ask them to do in that opening act is have a technical effect. And the, the technical effect gets to be what the kids want. Well, we do want to point out to you, and we'll talk more about it later on, that there's a, some ways that we've defined the technical scoring so that the kids have some things that they can look at and know that they can do it. This challenge can be solved very easily. It can be solved with great difficulty. And the scoring will reflect the amount of work and creativity that the kids have put into it. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, we're going to talk about scoring. So this is basically what the score sheet looks like. Um, and it would be really helpful if when you're working with your teams, you can have them almost appraise themselves after they complete a show or an operation or when they're working on their stage, say, okay, how do you think this stage would score, you know, under these three different things? Um, and then just breaking it down that way, just so that they've got an idea of what they're actually doing. And so like Susie mentioned, we're going to talk about what a technical effect is. Um, a technical effect is not how things move. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> a technical effect is going to be um, something, the, the more the kids don't touch it, the more technical it really is. And so it's something that happens and that's caused by something else. And um, it gets. It's defined in the challenge very carefully. I'll find my challenge real quick while Kayla talks to you. Yeah, I'll talk to you. Um, <laughs> so um, it's about one of the things that you can do um, 
with your teams, just like a nice activity that you can do with them, is creating a technical spectrum. So have them brainstorm some ideas of what they think technical looks like, and then have them rate them on a scale um, to see where you think they'd fit. And keep the scale working so that when they come up with a new idea, they can add it to their scale and see where it would fit on the ranks of uh, on the um, spectrum of technical, um, just so that they get a better idea of where they'd be scoring again. Another activity that you can do with your teams is have them bring a technical effect um, to your meeting. So have them look around their house and see what they can find, see what they can come up with, and see what type of effects they can actually bring to the different meeting to get some brainstorming going with the other team members and see if they can create something awesome out of that. Great. So we've got a technical effect that we're going to show you. And certainly there is nothing in this technical effect that couldn't be accomplished by a very, very, very young team. So um, what they're going to do is um, they're going to find something that they suspect might be the treasure, and they're going to begin dropping that in in their play. And as they drop that in, eventually they will get a map uh, sign that tells them they've not found the treasure, they've actually found the pirate um, purse. So um, on this one, it's not very difficult. And um, the thing is that it would score very highly because technical effects are scored for a couple of things. And one of them is reliability. That one focuses on two things. It's um, a lever and it's gravity. And gravity's never failed us yet here on this planet. So it's got some reliability going for it. So that one's going to score high on reliability, not so much on the technical design, because the design is fairly simple. But it could score very highly on reliability. So what you want your kids to do is look through the challenge and look at how we score technical effects, and then when they have one that they brought in, if they'll rate it themselves and say, you know, does it always work? Then it's reliable. Is it um, how many how many steps removed is it from you walking up and pushing a button or spring in the spring? And then they can decide if they want to make it more difficult, if they want to make it more reliable, how they want to change it. So another idea of something you could do um, are with instant challenges. So instant challenges are really nice because it's where you can teach them how to use things without actually interfering with the challenge. So ask, like putting together an instant challenge yourself and asking them to, you know, take something like a drill and have it move um, a platform or something like that. Um, you've got to be careful because you don't want to call it something like a state because that's where you start breaching that interference. But just different. You can put together different tools and get them to start experimenting with different motors and things like that so that they can learn about different ways to move things. I can go back to the instant challenge for just a second. The nice thing about instant challenge is that the kids will be experimenting, but then as you're um, after the instant challenge is complete, when you're debriefing, you are allowed to put your two cents worth in as well. So you can, if they've missed something completely, you can talk to the kids about something they might have tried, but you know, and you can even have them do it again. It's not considered interference because it's an instant challenge. So again, it can't be to solve this exact challenge, but you can teach them those principles and interject some teaching into it as well. And that's just some of the things that we've gone over um, with the scoring, but we're just going to move on, and we're going to now talk about uh, the Headlining Act. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, clarifications. So clarifications are super important. Um, you can get them at destinationimagination.org, um, and then there's more information on them on uh, page 25 of Rules of the Road. Um, clarifications are awesome because that chance for your team to specifically ask the um, international challenge masters any question that your team has about the challenge. So maybe you don't think that the challenge is as 
isn't specific enough on one piece, um, and so you're just curious about it. Um, but you can actually get more clarification on different pieces of the challenge. And the deadline for those is February 15th, and it's really important that you follow that deadline because if it's after February 15th, you can't get any more clarifications. You can't come to us affiliate challenge masters and ask us questions because we can't answer them the way that an international challenge master can. Um, and in addition to that, there are also public clarifications, and those are really important. Um, so far, I think we have two, and I only have one here for you, but you can get online and look at the other one. Um, and this one says that the opening and headlining acts, basically what this outlines is that the opening and headlining, headlining acts need to occur at different times. They can't occur at the same time. Um, and that you need to describe how the opening act begins and ends and how the headlining act begins and ends. Um, and that's really it with that one. I think it's important with that clarification that you have the kids really look at their descriptions in their paperwork and ask them if an adult who'd never seen this before would be able to tell when the opening act begins and ends and when the headlining act begins and ends. Definitely. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about rules of the road. And rules of the road should really be your best friend. This is just as important as the challenge because it outlines all of the different re um, all of the different little nuances to the challenge that you may not know otherwise. Um, it talks about what types of things are allowed, what types of things aren't allowed. Um, you know, things like laser pointers, not okay. Some people might have a really cool technical effect that makes us have to turn off the lights. We can't turn off the lights. Um, the fact that you have to have shoes with um, solid soles, things like that. Just different things that could be really dramatic and horrible if you showed up on game day and it wasn't ready to go. Um, it also outlines like the ceiling height that you'll have for, the, for our um, challenge and the area you'll have to work with. One of the most important things is fitting through a standard doorway. And a standard doorway for us might be different than the standard doorway you guys have at home. So it's really important that you look at those measurements and make sure that whatever you have is going to actually fit through that standard doorway. I think you've got an idea, especially if you're doing this in your garage at home, to try and get it through the garage door into the house. And we also want to point out that through the door, if it'll only come through the door in pieces, some of our challenge sites are going to be rooms and we can't offer a team a place necessarily where they can have a large space to put something together that takes a long time. We want the kids to be able to put it together pretty quickly once they get it through the door. Sometimes we're in a gym and we can offer a corner of the gym and that's the assembly area, but we can't guarantee that. Some of our school art sites could very well be in art rooms, band rooms, things like that. We're gonna give you the minimum for sure. We'll give them as much. Sorry about that. We have an echo. Um, we're gonna give you as much space as we possibly can give you, but we have to accommodate many challenges into some all of the schools, and it'll depend on how many sites we have to have as well. So um, you'll wanna make sure that you've checked with your your district challenge master, your regional challenge master, about where you're going to be, what the floor is going to look like. As soon as we know, we'll let you know. But um, I know, Kayla and Justin, you're South Metro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're at South Metro. Your place, uh, yeah. um, yes, we're at Chaparral High School. Your room isn't set. Though. Oh, no, we don't know our room yet. No, we have no idea if we're going to be in a classroom with carpet or if we're going to be in a gym with hardwood. So the kids need to know that, that the floor could be, it's not necessarily going to be a wooden gymnasium floor. We know at Globals it will not be a smooth surface without any imperfections. It, it's always in the conference center and, and it's a concrete floor but it's got holes in it and, and things like that. So um, we're going to give you what we every advantage we can give you but we want the kids to be prepared for it, that it may not be what it's always been before. So the next thing we want to give you here are some resources. And I think you should talk about if, that. If you have an opportunity to be in the Denver area at all, um, we really want to recommend a place called RAFT, which is a resource area for teachers. It's located over at 3827 Steel Street, over in a real industrial area. It's a warehouse, and 
it's a warehouse full of a DI team manager's dreams come true. Um, there's a little bit of everything and nothing there that you would think people would sell in a store. And they don't actually sell it, it's all donated materials and it's available for a very low cost, which just helps to pay the rent and things like that. Um, they also have Raft, so Raft is a great resource for you to just take the kids to get ideas for ways to build things. They also have some folks on the staff at RAP that if you contact them and say, we need a workshop for the kids on moving things, then they'll put together a workshop for your kids on moving things. Now, Kate, is there a cost for the workshop? Pardon me? Yes, minimal. A, a minimal cost for the workshops, and it's a very minimal cost for the workshops. So, if you have an opportunity to do that, it's a great idea to come and take the kids over to Raft. Call them first to see what days they allow kids to come. Most days it's only adults. If you're outside of the Denver area, you can go to raftcolorado.org and they have ideas there of things that you can do um, that are kind of like Mr. Wizard sorts of things that you can do with some pretty easily available materials to get the kids thinking about magnetism and movement and, and all the different kinds of science properties that they might want to use in this challenge. Okay. Another, since this is an acting challenge, and let's be honest, these are our technical kids, and many of them have chosen this because it's a technical challenge, but this has a huge, the opening act, the main act, their story, we got to have it this year. Um, it's a huge part of the challenge. So we've, we've looked up some places that you could, again, here in the Denver area, some places that will work with the kids and do some stagecraft kinds of workshops with them. The Vintage Theater in Aurora, um, they'll let the kids go backstage. They'll show them kind of how things work. If you go to the Denver Puppet Theater, the Denver Puppet Theater, the kids can sit through a puppet show, but as you know, a puppet show is completely technical effects. Um, the puppets themselves are a technical effect. And so everything that they would be able to look at behind the scenes at the Denver Puppet Theater is going to be technical effects. We've also listed some other places, the Town Hall Arts Center in Littleton, Aurora Fox Arts Center, there's the Arvada Center. Um, even for the folks who are not in the Denver area, our biggest recommendation would be high schools, junior colleges, and colleges. Many will have theater programs and robotics programs. And our high schools, we're lucky in Colorado that most of our high schools insist that the kids do a certain amount of community service. And working with your team, explaining robotics or how theater effects work, would certainly qualify as community service for those kiddos. So it's an excellent uh, resource form and I think if you can imagine your elementary or, or middle school kids how much they would think that was pretty wonderful for high school or college kids to spend some time talking to them um, that could make their day so um, maybe we can also get some of our high school and college kids interested in DI and that would be a double win for all of us. <laughs> Um, so next we're going to talk about technical design and innovation. And so technical design is basically, you sure? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to trade places here so that Justin could talk about technical design too. So you can see him talk. So um, technical design is really the idea of reliability. Yeah, and uh, so technical design is um, can't do the job every time, all the time. So it's not a very well-designed car if you hop in the car and you have a one in five chance of it not going. So that's what we're really focusing on in our uh, technical design is making sure that these, whatever tech effect that you have is repeatable. So it's very common for teams to have this amazing te technical design in their basement and it uh, shoots these rockets and it does all of this crazy stuff, but they can't get it out of the basement or when they move it out of the basement, they can get it out of the basement, but they can't get it back together again. So this goes into that modularity of your design and making sure that 
whatever the situation and wherever you are set, if you have to travel five miles in the rain to get to the to wherever your um, event is at or whatever, then your um, technical effect is still going to work. I also want to say please don't bring rockets because we won't let you perform with them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then um, innovation is the other piece, and innovation is a lot like thinking about creativity. So, for example, uh, the Tesla is a pretty good example of creativity. It's an all-electric car. It's that kind of nobody ever thought of it. There's a great quote by Ford where he says that um, uh, if I'd asked them what they wanted, uh, they would have wanted a faster horse. And he invented the car. So it's this idea of thinking outside of the box and whatever this technical creation you created is innovative and new. And that looks a lot different uh, at different age levels. So for us, uh, something like a, us, as, as, us as adults, something like a uh, joke. Um, joke. No, knock knock jokes. <laughs> knock knock jokes. Us, as adults, <laughs> knock knock jokes aren't very funny. We, we not kind of know how they're going to go, but they're going to. They're knock knock who's there, and we know we know what's coming. We know we've heard all the good ones. But kindergartners, they're brand new to this idea of a knock knock joke, so they think they're hysterical. So as appraisers, we're trying to judge them on what they find to be innovative. So if their technical effect involves um, soldering LEDs to some kind of a board or something like that, and this is brand new material for them, we're going to judge them much higher than we would judge somebody else, because somebody who's an adult. That makes sense. Yeah, we're holding them to on different scales. So high school kids are not going to be judged the same way that middle school and um, elementary school. Yep. That's how we break them up? Yep. <laughs> okay, so again, it's that idea of new, different, unexpected. That's what we're looking for. And we're looking for new, different, and unexpected for them. And then we go to workmanship. And workmanship is really important, too. So one of the best things, workmanship is equivalent to like how much effort they put in. And the design. So for example, um, uh, do we have our hats? No, no. We used to have pirate hats. And something like a pirate hat that I make myself is going to score higher on workmanship than someone that goes to the store and buys a pirate hat. Even if that pirate hat is way more professionally done and crafty, what's important is that I put effort into this one and I've made this one. And that's what we're really looking for with workmanship. So one of the things you can do with workmanship is create a spectrum. So we're going back to this hat idea. At uh, the low end of the spectrum, we would have, say, a, um, a store-bought pirate hat. Uh, kind of a little bit higher up than that, we would have maybe a, a piece of new, newspaper folded into a regular hat like you would think of Tom Sawyer. Uh, a little bit higher than that, we might decorate that newspaper hat, put some feathers on it, maybe some writing, uh, paint it or something like that. And up from there, we might have like somebody who actually sews a hat and they um, stitch it all together and it looks like a pirate hat that they sewed. And uh, it might not look as professional as the one that the, this from the store bought, but it has significant more workmanship because of because the student made it. So one of the things you can do with your teams is work with them and have them create a workmanship spectrum where they sit down and they all think of different ideas of how to do something and they say, okay, well we think that this would score higher and this would score lower, and again, just keep that spectrum working all year round. And then we're going to talk about integration. And so integration is really about asking yourself the question, if we were to take this out of the act, would the act be different? Would it be lacking something? Um, and so let's say you have some very, very talented um, singers on your team. And they want to do a musical piece component to their uh, play. If they stand and start at the play, they sing, and it's a song about um, fairies, and then immediately after that we launch into a story about pirates. There's no connection there, and there's no point for that song that happens. So the idea is that for that song to be integrated, it has to mesh with everything else that's going on. It has to fit the theme, and the story has to be changed by the fact that we added that song. 
So yeah, again, if we were to take it out of the performance, would the performance be any worse? It should be. If it's thoroughly integrated, if you were to remove that piece, the performance should feel like it's lacking something. Um, so there are some activities you can do uh, with your team to encourage this type of integration. And one of those things is improving with props. Um, improv is a really fun, easy, takes not a whole lot of planning, um, but just giving your team some different props or having different your different members bring props to the table um, and then from home to the meetings. And then you can sit down and have them improv and actually have to integrate the props into their story. Um, that would be a really great way to practice that integration piece. And that's that. We have found our treasure. And I think that's it. <laughs> so um, if you guys have any questions, now would be a great time to ask those. I don't know if there's anything else, Susie, you want to add? No, we just want to really, really emphasize that deadline for instance, the deadline 15. All right. <laughs> because the four of us will try to answer your questions, but we can't get into the clarification. And so we want to be really careful that if you have a question, the first place to go is to ask the international challenge masters. But we also want you to feel like you can ask the regional challenge masters and the four of us to the state affiliate challenge masters. Anything that you want to ask us, we're here to help. So we don't want to wait until two days before the tournament and have somebody just break down because they have a misunderstanding about a piece of the challenge. If you have something that's not going well for you, if, if you have a team that it's getting to be the end of February and they're still not getting anywhere, feel free to go on with us and we can try and help you with some things that we've seen people do with teams, we've done with teams, we've done with other our teams that help the kids to move off their itself. So um, we'll have other webinars that you can look at for new two managers and for time management and things like that. But we don't want to say that we're always here to help. If you have a question about what the floor is going to look like, contact the regional challenge ministry and as soon as they know, we want to get the right way. So I know it and go for it. Okay. Um, so we have a series of questions here that we're going to start off with. Um, so at the top we have, can we have a copy of the slides? The slides are actually attached in the handout. Um, there are, it's, there's one of five handouts. It should be along your sidebar. Um, and you, can, you have access to all of the slides that we showed you today. Um, if you can't find that, shoot us an email. We'll get them over to you. It is also on the DI Colorado website on the challenge page um, if you're looking for a copy of the slides. And then it says, can we discuss the performance taking place on the stage versus off of the stage? Um, so the entire act, everything that's going on doesn't have to take place on the stage, but part of the opening and part of the closing act must take part, place on the stage. Does that sound well? Does that, that's, there's also a, um, a public clarification on that. So I would get on the DI Colorado website, look at the clarifications. They define what the stage is a little more clearly um, so that that can be of some help for you too. And then we have, um, can we show our team videos of tech effects to generate ideas? So with that, you just want to avoid um, interference. So it'd be best if you could have them look up tech effects on YouTube, things like that. Um, it's also possible for you to kind of throw something to, to the extreme, be uh, absolutely impossible. So um, if you want to show them an example of, say, like the Olympics opening ceremonies, which are generally fairly highly technical, you would be able to show that mostly because it's just to give them like an idea and get their brains moving. It's kind of like, um, here's an intro to our meeting, right? Do you have any certainly idea? not something to expect kids to be doing that technical thing. Um, yeah, if you find some things on YouTube, you know that your kids are struggling with a technical effect, they want to make something disappear. And then you can find some things on YouTube. Um, you can look at uh, mad science, uh, 
websites. You can look at um, Steve Spangler websites. Those kinds of things have a lot of things that are science experiments and things, but they're also very much technical. Um, and then the next question we have is, does the movement aspect of the stage have to be physically attached to the stage? Will it count if the kids have a vehicle on the stage? So with that one, that would be a clarification question that you would want to submit um, to the ICMs. So with that, you've got 10 clarifications that you can use, and I know very few teams actually use all 10, so don't be afraid to use them. Um, but you want to make sure that when you're asking that, you're very specific um, and that you're only asking one clarification per per like reach out to them because if you ask two questions, you can't answer two questions, you've burnt one of your clarifications. Um, and then, so I, we, we can't answer that. <laughs> um, and then really excited for a field trip to the theater or puppet theater, is that accessible? Um, other puppet theaters and things like that, you know, for sure. And I would certainly, any theater that you're going to go to, I'm pretty sure when I talk with the people over at the one in Littleton, the Littleton Town Arts Theater, um, they were absolutely accommodating as they could be. And I know that if you call them and said, these are the limitations, this is the mobility issue that we have, they would be able to tell you first if they were accessible. And most of the places that I talk to would go out of their way to make it accessible. And then the last question we have for right now is uh, we would love a clarification on how large the stage needs to be, how much of the performance needs to take place on the stage, et cetera. Um, and with that, that would be a question for the ICMs. But again, in the challenge, it says that the stage is defined by the team. So the team gets to define their stage. But if you're really wondering, I would send, I would definitely always recommend sending in a clarification to the ICMs and having them answer that for you. Make sure you're really specific. And then we have a couple more. We have vintage theater. The vintage theater, um, you, you can talk about the vintage theater. Yeah, the vintage theater is, um, they offer tours backstage is why um, we recommended them. Hold on, they can't hear you, so hold on. Okay, so here we are. The Let's Vintage Theater was recommended because they offer backstage tours, and that one was a little bit more expensive. They actually are set up to do schools, and so less than 25 kids, they don't have much of a price break on it. Um, but they had a lot of good information, and, and they really <coughs> have some set workshops that they'll do with them. They say they still can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, let's try that. Let me relax. All right, can I hear you now? Sid, can you hear me now? Because I don't have the loudest voice after a day of teaching first grade. The Vintage Theater was one of the places we recommended because they have, and I can't read it. Oh, that's better. Oh, good. <laughs> they have set workshops that they do with kids. We did think that that one was a little bit more expensive because they're used to working with schools and there wasn't much of a price break under 25 kids. You might call them and say, you know, what what do you offer and what could you do for us for a nonprofit? But you might get as good information and as good a tour if you talk to your high school theater teacher too. So, um you guys said high schools. Sorry, I forgot. No, yeah, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. Um, so that's all the questions we have right now. Um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to ask them. We'll hang out for a couple minutes. And then I'm also going to send over all of our emails just so that you can get us um, if you have any additional questions in the future. Okay, so you guys should have all of our emails. Thank you so much for hanging out with us for a little bit. <laughs> Wonderful. Excited being a new coach. <laughs>
And then who can tell us the specifics on the performance location of the room? So you're going to get that from your RCM, which is your regional challenge master, um, and that will be on the DI Colorado website. Um, so if you're in like South Metro, that will be S2. If you're um, in Cherry Creek, you can reach out to Susie. <laughs> If it's Denver or Cherry Creek, I'll be the one that will have that information as soon as we have it. The four of us will have the information about the state tournament, but probably not until sometime in March. Yeah. So it's going to be a while. Each one of these places, we have to find all the spaces that are available and then decide which one of the challenges needs that space the most. So um, it's trying to fit seven challenges into one building. So. We'll do the best we can and we'll give you the information as soon as we can. Absolutely. Yeah, and I hope that that helps everybody out. Oh, in addition to that, a copy of our webinar um, is going to be up on the DI Colorado webpage. Um, so you can go there if you want to rewatch us. Um, <laughs> or not. <laughs> or share it with your friends or your team managers or anybody else that needs access to it. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you in March. Uh, Should we attend the training on Saturday? So I would say, yeah, I would attend the training on Saturday because there's a lot more than just our challenge that's going to be talked about there. Um, they're going to talk about instant challenges. They're going to talk about all kinds of tips and tricks for team managers. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a big general session that talks about the process. Um, it's it's really valuable. It's really valuable if you can attend. I would make time for it if you can. There will also be sessions in the afternoon on that day too um, that break out into different little pieces. If you want any help with those, you don't have to stay for the afternoon. Um, it's also a really good chance for you to sit down with your ACMs or your RCMs because most of us will be there. So if you had any specific questions or wanted to talk to us, that would be a good time to sit down with us and um, talk to us one on one as well. In more in depth than new team managers. Okay, so are we going to go more in depth for new team managers is how I'm taking that question. Um, it'll be the same, pre we'll give the same presentation. Yeah. We're going to share the same information at both the experienced team managers and the new team managers. We split it off so that the experienced team managers sometimes ask questions that a little bit frightening to new team managers. So we just split it up that way, but we're not going to give any information to one group that we don't give to the other. Yeah. But again, I would definitely attend if you have the time on Saturday. It's well worth it. And I think that's it. Unless you guys have any more questions, and again, you can email us. Um, we're all available. <laughs> Thank you to the hardest working volunteers, the team managers. Yeah.